Welcome back, everybody, to another exciting Lord Duckman's Garage. Yeah, ho oh, ho. We're back with this 1970 convertible Beetle that you're seeing right here. And this little guy is gorgeous. It doesn't have a whole lot that it needs. It's a little bit of this and that, and I'm going to be fixing some of it in today's video. One of the things we're going to address first is that the throttle cable is busted. So in order for me to even start it, it requires two people because you have to modulate the throttle just a little bit to get it to fire up. And without that, well, you can't you can't get it to light off. It just it won't. So, I'm going to address the throttle cable first, and I'm going to get rid of the damn fuel filter that's inside the engine compartment. And then we're going to go around and adjust a few other things. Uh, the brake pedal, for example, fell forwards or backwards onto the floor, so I have to fix that also. It should be just a matter of adjusting the, uh, the pedal stop. Then when I got those things set, uh, we could probably take this thing out for a test drive, making a couple little adjustments here and there, and take it out and about. I still haven't disconnected the tow bar yet because when I towed this thing home the other day, it, uh, it was getting rainy, so I just kind of propped it up where it won't where it need to be just so it wasn't going to get in the mud. But I guess before we get on to anything else, let's leaky likey, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to plug the thing, but let's get updates every time I upload a video, and we'll be back right after that intro. Yes. Boop. Back here at the engine, first thing we need to do is loosen up the hold fast, aka barrel connector, on the throttle cable. Usually it's an 8mm. Typically you can just pop it out with a ratchet. Just need to get it loose enough that the throttle cable comes out of it, and that will probably, yeah, that'll do it. You don't have to completely remove the barrel connector. But if it does come out, don't lose it. That could be a problem if you do. So I'll put it right there just so I know where it's at. But the throttle cable here, I'm going to pull on it just a little bit and not completely out. And the reason why I'm not pulling it completely out is because there's a Bowden tube on the back of this engine. At least there should be. <laughs> if I have a problem feeding this cable through and it does not come out where I'm pushing it through here, and it's giving me an issue and it binds up somewhere, I'm gonna have to get up underneath the car, find where it's at, and then force it through. But if it does have the Bowden tube like it's supposed to, if I push the new cable through with the old cable still in line, generally it, they will go through together and it shouldn't be as big of a problem. This is kind of something that two people operation would work. One could push the cable while one could gently tug on this one. But in my experience, pushing the one through from the inside is usually enough to get it. And if it doesn't, well, now I'm just going to have to do what I have to do to make it go. But like I said, sometimes you get lucky anyway and it'll just happen. So let's go ahead and shove that cable through from the front. And like I said, I like to lube them as I'm shoving them in. So I'm hoping that this goes through. See, I've got the cable already routed through there. And I'd like to get in through the driver's side, but I can't because I can't open the door wide enough. But if I lean in here, you can see the throttle cable is right here. Where is it? Added to my finger a minute ago. Oh, it already went in a tube because I pulled it in. <laughs> there's a little tube right here. Now the throttle cable has two ends on it. It's got the straight end, and on the layer cable, it's got the Z-shaped end. Here's the Z-shaped end. This is the piece that clips into the side of the throttle pedal down inside of there. So this is the piece that goes in last, because clearly you can't push that through a tube. The earlier ones have a uh, question mark shaped hook. So the procedure is otherwise pretty much the same. We're just going to get this thing, put it in the little tube that's underneath there. All right, doing this one-handedly. Just greasing it up, shoving it in. <laughs> It feels like it's gone through, so I think it has. So we'll go check in the back, and it should be sticking out of the uh, tube that's in the uh, air shroud. All right, there it is. Make sure our little Z is. Yeah. You can't see nothing, but there's a little Z right here. We'll just make sure it's accessible and it hasn't tucked itself in somewhere. All right, let's run around the back and see what we got. There it is, guys. As I said, you don't always get that lucky. To push this cable out with the other cable yeah i mean it helps sometimes if you flare the end of it a little bit but this one was already that because it broke so 
So anyway, this is garbage. We can get rid of that thing. And we need to reattach this cable. But the reason why I pushed it through rather than just pulling the other one out and just expecting the new one to go in place is because that old cable is actually holding three tubes together. There's the little tube that's here, there's the Bowden tube that's underneath on top of the transmission, and then there's the long metal tube that runs through the chassis. All three of those have to be in alignment because if they come out of alignment after you pull the cable out, the cable just gets tangled up somewhere underneath the car. And it's a real pain in the ass to try to figure out where it went to. Nonetheless, this is solved. This is the easy way to do it, and it doesn't work all the time, but I'd say, yeah, 80, 90% of the time for me. It allowed me to make a home run, essentially, to run that cable right through all those tubes, and uh, everything was in alignment, because the other cable held it there. If you push a little too hard, or you do something a little jerky, I mean, I guess you could push them apart, you know, and then when you try to snake the cable through, then they can go like that. I mean, I've experienced a lot of different weird things, but you saw it yourself, it worked. Now, this little tube that's underneath here, this thing always seems to come out. I'm lucky that it was in at all. <laughs> that's another reason why <laughs> why I had this uh, old cable in there to hold everything together. Because that thing loves to come out. Now, the proper way to fix that is to put a zip tie in the back of the air shroud, but I can't get to it. So, it's, it's not going to get one, unfortunately, because it's just not possible for me to get these giant mitts around the back side of that shroud to solve that problem. Okay, anyway, what we need to do now is we need to put our barrel on. It looks like I dropped it. Here it is. I thought I lost it. Oh, man. But the throttle cable needs to come back through here. On the top. And through that barrel. But you know what? Before we even get into that, we need to hook up the throttle cable uh, up front at the pedal. Because otherwise, this is just going to go in all the way and it goes nowhere. <laughs> all right, let's get that hooked up up front. All right. I can see a little twinkle down there in the throttle uh, lever. See that little light spot? That is actually the little hole where the little Z-end is supposed to go into. I've never done this work from the passenger side before, but uh, I'm going to say this is a lot easier for somebody my size. There it is. See how that's just kind of put through that hole? Now we have a working throttle. Of course, there's nothing holding it on on the other side at the engine yet, but we're about to work on that. But essentially, we can call that just about done. All right, let's go in the back and get the rest hooked up. If you're a big-handed bandit like I am, it's a little tough to get in here. This fuel line that you guys are seeing is kind of in your point of view, isn't it? Yeah, it's right in the way. Well, if you can't see, it's probably going to be because of my hands, not because of a fuel line but anyway we want to put this hold fast back in here and I got a set of needle nose to try and I got extra long ones too as you probably noticed here to try and get this cable routed up through the back side of this thing oh man <laughs> this is the kind of thing it makes me need a nap. A tall drink and a nap. And I think I'm completely out of cola. And I don't like shooting my drink straight up, so yeah, that means I just gotta wait till I go to the store. Bummer. <laughs> Alright, come on, go in that little hole. Why didn't it line up? I need somebody here with little guitar playing fingers, something like uh, Isaiah, Isaiah VW, where are you at man? I need your little hands over here, get in here and fix this for me. I'm showing this to you guys in real time, I usually edit it out and only show you the success, no not really, I actually usually show you the failures so you guys know what you're going to run into and uh, this is um, this is aggravating the shit out of me. <laughs> There it goes. All right, now we're through. Boop. Just like that. Pull it. Try to get any slack out of it. We're good, but don't pull it so damn hard 
against the gas pedal. Otherwise, what you're going to run into is a cable that's so tight that when you floor it, it's going to stretch the cable, which will cause it to break prematurely. So the prescribed method for that is to open the throttle all the way with a brick on the gas pedal inside and then snug up your little holdfast barrel on the side. That's for those of you that have never done this before. If you know how to feel for this, you know how to properly adjust it, then of course that doesn't happen, but that's the prescribed method if you don't know better. Okay. Well, let's get this all snugged up. I just dicked it up here. I don't know what the hell I just did, but something just got jammed. Get back in there. What's your problem? Yeah, I got all cocked up here. Man, I had to mess with it. I've never seen this happen before. How is it all the way through and jammed? <laughs> there it goes. That was weird. All right, well, we're good. As I said, I can do this by feel, but if you don't have that experience, put a brick on the gas pedal, open the throttle all the way, and then tighten that barrel clamp down. Okay, we should have a throttle cable again, which means we should effectively be able to start this car. But before we do that, you know what else we're going to do? We're also going to fix this uh, power wire, because currently the power wire goes from the little plunger on this side back around to the choke, and that's it. Nothing connects to the positive on the coil, so we're going to fix that, because this is hokey. This is not how it's supposed to be. Alright, we're just going to put a quick length of cable to solve the problem, and then we're done with that. After fussing around with the wire, I found three connector wire. It was on the backup wire, which was only connected through one of the junctions. The other ones were just dangling, so the wire that was wrapped around for the choke that went to the plunger was somebody's garbage repair, I suppose. This actually was just dangling in here and could have started a fire, but there's enough connectors on this that it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need an extra piece of wire, it just needs to be hooked up right. This was just total bullshit in here. <laughs> I don't know who did what to this, but this will get it straight again, okay. This wire now goes around and then into the plunger on this side. Which I don't even think that's working. So it really doesn't matter whether or not I even hook it up. And then the last wire, after it goes to the choke, this should go to the positive on the coil. So no extra wire was needed, it just needed to be hooked up right, and this extra red wire that was hooked up wrong can go away. Alright, that should get the choke working on it. Gotta get this fuel filter out of here yet. Alright, put our air cleaner back on. This is an oil bath air cleaner, you don't want to tip it on its side, because why? Because the oil runs out everywhere. There it is. Good. In it, but I did this work with the battery disconnected. And you might be saying, hey Duckman, why'd you disconnect the battery? And that's because all those little throttle tubes that I had mentioned to you, if something came apart, the cable, as you know, is grounded to the chassis. So if for some reason they came apart and it snaked around the inside of the chassis, uh, on top of the transmission, and that throttle cable hit the positive wire on the starter, you would have had a fire. I mean, this thing, yeah, that wire would have started glowing red hot and it would have been bad. And there's, of course, no way for you to easily get to it. So the answer is disconnect that. And I should have said that in advance. I just didn't. But yeah, disconnect the, uh, the battery so that way you don't have that problem. Now, of course, my cables didn't come out of alignment, so it wasn't an issue. But if for some reason that happened, it could have done that. And ask me how I know. Everybody's always doubting me, telling me I do things wrong, but ask me how I know. I learned a lot of this stuff by experience. I made a lot of mistakes, and these are not the things they tell you in the instruction manual. So yeah, disconnect that battery if you're going to be feeding the throttle cable through that chassis. Just in case something comes out of alignment and that wire cable, I should say, gets tangled around the inside on top of the transmission and hits that starter wire, you'll end up with a big problem. I actually had the problem when I did it myself was with a, uh, a heater box cable. Yeah, so I ended up with a, a red-hot cable. I didn't see it right away. I started to smell some smoke. 
and then real quickly I pulled the cable back through into the chassis so I was able to uh, stop it from burning and becoming a bigger issue but yeah it was an awful awful smell and of course the wire was ruined I had to replace it and those things well while they're cheap per se it's still a pain in the ass you gotta go and you gotta buy another one because once they glow red hot they become fatigued and they don't work worth a damn anymore this is insight it might sound like a lot of this but you know what you guys need to listen to this stuff these are things that I've learned this is mistakes that I've made I've been down this road before this is not my first time <laughs> all right well that throttle cable should work um, I'm going to try to slip in there. I don't know if I can get in that driver's seat, but we'll see if we can get this thing fired up because I think once I reconnect that battery, it should start back up. All right, you guys don't understand just how hard it was to get into this car with this seat in this position. I am not even going to try to start it or run it or anything from the driver's side. <sighs> All right. I saw this thing start about two weeks ago. But it took two people to do it. I was on the throttle and I had someone else operating the key. Make sure we're not in gear. All right, here we go. Oh, I heard Bluetooth too. The man it fired up easy. All right, well that's good. I'm on the throttle a little bit right now. I want to make sure that that uh, choke opens up like it's supposed to. Make sure this thing warms up like it's supposed to. Give the thing a good look over, and if that's all good, then we'll move on to the next stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think we're in a good spot otherwise. Sounds good. Might have to raise the idle a little bit. Look, the generator light is flickering. It does seem like it's idling a little low, but... Might even be a belt slipping. I'll have to look at that. Now it's out. Could also be a dirty connector somewhere. I've seen that happen before too. In fact, while we're watching this, it's actually gained gas. It was at a half a tank and now it's growing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check on that generator and find out what's up there. Something's definitely up. But it runs. We're in good shape. I'm going to be driving this thing from the passenger seat. This is ridiculous. The brake pedal feels good, though. Really, a nice, solid brake. I did see some stainless steel lines when I stuck my head underneath there, and that would be why. Oops. All right. That engine might need a little bit of work. I have to play with the uh, fuel mixture screws and stuff at idle. Possibly even the idle screw. Oh, you'll have a horn. Well, I guess I'll look at that, too. All right, good. That's working, that's nice. Signal on the left, signal on the right. No horn. Does it affect which way I've got the wheel pointed? Nope, not affected by any of that. All right, we'll get the horn looked at. Generator lights being a dick. All right, we'll figure that out. All right, next step. All right, it appears to be running pretty well. I'm gonna raise the idle on it just a smidge. It does have the correct distributor on it. In fact, it's the exact model that I recommend to people to put on here. It's a proper 034 SVDA distributor with a vacuum advance. Shooting gas 
over to that side of the engine. Thankfully, it backfired in traffic, just coincidentally, and people started screaming, you're on fire. And I didn't know it was me until I looked at the rearview mirror and I saw clouds of smoke. And I managed to beat it out with my shirt. I had just bought the car, so it didn't even have a fire extinguisher in it yet. But I saved the day and it didn't get ruined. I even drove away before the fire department got there. <laughs> All right, well. There's some loud Latin tribal music going on across the street there, so if you guys hear it, that's what it is, so you'll hear a little music in the background. Nonetheless, I came on in here to check the timing, and I discovered it was not only the timing was way off, but the vacuum advance wasn't working. And you know I love these distributors, and this is the very same distributor that I would recommend to any of you, the same one that you've seen me install a bunch of times, just recently even. But here's the big no-no. You see this vacuum line? You notice how it comes from the carburetor and goes straight down? Well, any fuel that ends up in there could sometimes go down the line and it'll eat the little diaphragm inside the vacuum canister. So I think that's what happened because when I went to uh, suck on this thing to see if I got any advance, it got zero, nothing. And I couldn't get any vacuum at all on my tongue. So if I can't get any suction on my tongue, <laughs> And that means we're gonna have a very bad day. So I went by Wild Bill's house and he happened to have another one. We got lucky. So I'm gonna pull that one off of there and uh, change out the vacuum can and it should be good to go after that. And then I'm going to install a proper shepherd's hook, which is what you find on all stock beetles. It's this guy. I just made that up with a little bit of bending some an old brake line. So what we'll do is we'll use a little bit of this rubber line to put it on either end get this thing hooked back up and it should be good to go after that but otherwise pull that off I'm gonna pull our cap off of here get this out of the way rotor off plastic out and down inside of there you can see the little sir clip that holds the vacuum canister on so I gotta get in there with some needle nose pop that out and then Phillips head screw here Phillips head screw there and the whole vacuum canister comes right out that's all there is to it The old one.
after Top Dead Center. It was firing a couple degrees beyond that. So yeah, it's before Top Dead Center. It's actually at idle. It fell at 12. So that distributor's got a little bit of wear on it. But that's okay. We set the maximum to 32. Should be good to go. This thing sounds so much better as it is. Uh, at this point, I guess we can uh, let it warm up. Maybe even try to take it for a little ride. And then when I uh, come back, we'll dump the hot oil out of it. And uh, then we'll deal with things like Wiley oil straining, replacing the fuel filter, and a couple of other little things that are on it here. But otherwise, this thing's coming along. Sounds so much better. Oh my. Look at that. Wow, no smoke or nothing either. Not that it did before, but. We are very happy with how that runs. I still need to figure out why the generator light is coming on and troubling us so much though. But I checked the emergency brake. I was wondering why you could pull it to the moon and it would not actuate. It went to rolling out of the driveway where the car came from and it was rolling backwards down the driveway. Couldn't control it with the e-brake. But looking at the uh, adjustments here, you can see that the screws or nuts, I should say, are at the very, very tips of the threaded bits, which means this thing is, needs to be tightened a lot. See, it's actually coming off of its little, uh, the little dick, which is broken off of this thing too. You see the little hole in the middle there, right there? It only has a dick that comes up through there and they break off on all these cars. You can function without it. Yeah, there's a purpose for it to be there so the balance beam doesn't fall off in the event that the cable's loosened, but uh, it's been real easy. We're just gonna loosen the nuts and then run them back in and then check the thing. We're looking for that. Three clicks. One, two, three, and you should be feeling it right on the third one. All right, here we go. See, I ran the nuts down a little bit. Let's try it. Two, three, four. Four. I feel it on two, two, three, one, two, three, four. Yeah, right after the fourth one, I'm feeling it snugging up. One, two, three, and yeah, right at number four. Okay, so we need to go just a hair tighter. All right, should be easy enough. Impact is great for this job. Try again. One, two, yep. Right after two, between two and three. One, two, try again. I feel like I'm getting another click out of it somewhere. One, two, yep, right there at three. This is perfect. Actually, it's got a working emergency brake. All right. One, two, and right at three, good. So we got a working emergency brake again. Yep, right there. Fantastic. All right, now we want to tighten these two nuts against each other. You know how it works. Put a wrench on the bottom and then tighten the top one. Easy enough. It's about to get dark. Early in the morning, we're going to come do the uh, oil on this thing. Meanwhile, let's get everything closed up and wrapped up. It's so weird having weird crank up windows on a convertible. You know, hard roof beetles don't have them. Be a nice feature though, maybe I should build it into one. Yeah, too bad Eleanor's already painted, right? Hey Earl, we're gonna cut into your work. And you had some roll up rear windows. <laughs> All right, get this one rolled up too. good spot. That's where she sits. We'll see you in the morning. The following day. Alright, good morning everybody. Back today with the beetle. The convertible. The prevertible. Get in here and kick some of the dirt off my feet. Rained last night. Got a little muddy out here. And yes, I'm in the passenger seat because I can't get in the driver's seat. <laughs> We're cold starting this sucker this morning. And you know what? I think I, yeah, yesterday I was playing with the battery and I disconnected it. Duck man, why would you do that? Well, because I just got the car and the generator light is coming on, staying on solid. I don't know what kind of electrical problem we have. Could be that regulator right there, that's the culprit. We'll be investigating that later today. But, 
not knowing if there's actually an electrical problem that could burn the car to the ground, I decided to just leave the battery unhooked last night. All right, here's our eight lights. The Bluetooth thing is going to make a bloop, bloop, bloop sound any second. There it goes. <laughs> we didn't have to wait for that. It just it entertains me. So, <laughs> and uh, make sure we're not in gear. We're not. Like he likes to stick in the start position. Generator light is on. It's interesting. Yesterday, when I would rev it, it would get brighter. Brighter is usually a telltale sign that the uh, regulator is shot. All right, I wonder if I can drive it from this position. Yeah, I think I can. All right. <laughs> oh, shit. E-brake is on. Not anymore. Driving from the passenger seat. This is a first for me. Boy, it's a throw off my coordination, that's for sure. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend this to everybody. <laughs> I'm just trying to get up in the driveway where I can change the oil comfortably. off here not driving in straight at all <laughs> right, here we are the motor makes some good torque all right all I gotta do is put my ramps under the back wheels that will level the car and we can let the oil out Whenever I change the oil in one of my cars in the driveway, people always say, well, if you do it while it's level, it would drain properly. It is level. I could put a level right there on the door sill, and it would be <laughs> almost nuts on. Anyway, putting it up on a ramp like that gives me the best of both worlds. Not only is the rear end jacked up, but it levels the car out, which makes it a whole lot easier for me to get under there to let the oil out. Yeah, so for those of you that want to comment, well, I've beat you yet again. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to let it uh, get nice and hot. I wanted to take it for a ride ride, but a little hard for me to drive it from the uh, passenger seat, at least until I figure out what's going on with the driver's seat anyway. And you know what? While it's warming up, I guess we could dick with that now. Before, before I brought this home that that seat was welded in, and uh, I just tried to skeet it forwards and back. It's not going anywhere. In fact, the uh, adjuster lever that's on the side, it's not even meshing with the teeth that are underneath. The seat is in a fixed position, so yeah, it's gonna require a little bit of surgery to get that figured out. Still gotta fix that pedal. I keep forgetting about that. It's gonna be hard for me to reach it from this side because where the seat's at, I guess I'll dive in through the passenger side again. Anyway, a few more minutes. The engine should be nice and warm, and uh, we'll dump that oil. All right, we'll get in here and change that oil. I usually like to do this while the engine's still running. You gotta be brave like a duck, man. If you're fast enough, right? You can do it without the engine season. I'm kidding, guys. The audio was dubbed. <laughs> Somebody out there is gonna believe that. You know what the duck man just did today? Oh man. Let's see if I can get this out of here without getting up. Nope. Well, you know what? The plug didn't go in, and I barely got any on me. The plug went way over there. We'll clean that off before we put it back in. Anyway, we'll let that oil run. Might give it 30 minutes to an hour. I like to let it like drip, drip, drip. This is not a quick change oil place where they put the plug back in immediately while it's still running out. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to this. We're gonna remove the strainer too. One hour later. 
and this has been waiting way over an hour for the oil to drain out of it because I had some internet problems which I was trying to resolve. My AT&T decided to take a dump for no particular reason so since I do everything on the internet it's of utmost importance for me to get my internet back up and running. So I called them six times. Each time I got different message prompts. One time I actually got through to somebody only to be hung up on. And each time I'm getting hung up on, always just some reason the phone will just disconnect. And it could be my cell service, which is also AT&T. So if you've watched my videos in the past and you've been with me for a while, you may remember the video series of uh, how AT&T killed my business. Well, here they are again, trying to kill my business. So I'm checking their website, trying to find alternative methods to uh, get in touch with them. I try using the chat feature. The chat feature, when I push the button, doesn't do anything. It does nothing, absolutely nothing. So while I'm fighting with all this stuff, a uh, tinkering guy, Jason Quayle, if you guys know him, he messaged me and says, hey, Duckman, your website's down. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> AT&T decided to uh, take a dump on me yet again. So anyway, we had a laugh about it at AT&T's, ooh, I got out of the way just in time, at AT&T's expense while I'm still battling with their internet and trying to get it to work. Anyway, I finally got through. The prompts were different yet again. You know, all the push numbers bullshit, just ask different questions. It's the same number I keep calling. But they shunted me somewhere else and I got a robot. And I hate robots unless a robot can give me the answer. So while I was um, listening to the robot, the robot told me finally that they acknowledge that there's a problem. Whereas before they were telling me nothing's wrong. When they test the modem, they say it's offline, but everything's fine. Well, how can it be offline and fine at the same time? So anyway, that was just total bullshit. But anyway, the recording said there's a network outage and they did not say how big the outage was or you know, how big the coverage was. But finally they admit to there being a problem. The problem was no longer on my end. So I took my cable modem. Well, technically it's a DSL modem. It's fiber, but it's a DSL modem. I ran it outside and I hooked it up directly to my box just to make sure that my box wasn't the problem. Where the hell's my screwdriver? I thought I dropped my screwdriver a minute ago. Maybe it went in the oil pan? I oh, know, it's under me. There it is. Didn't go in the oil pan, just rolled away. So, anyway, I hooked up my modem outside just to demonstrate to myself that's not my wiring in the house. You know, if I had a bad fiber cable or something run through the house, and it happens. I had it happen the day after my fiber was installed. A friggin' rodent chewed through my fiber optic cable outside the house. I mean, it just got installed and it's already ruined. Friggin' rodent. Tell you what, the wire was just too close to the ground. And we do have rats here. I mean, this is Pensacola. This is where the original settlements came in with the first ships. And they brought the rats with them. And these rats are the descendants of those fuckers that have been here ever since. So whenever I get an opportunity to uh, eliminate them, I do. There's always some traps set in the yard. They have to be careful that the chickens and the ducks don't get caught in them. All right. I think I'm going to need both hands to pry this out of here. It's going. It just needs a little more, a little more something. So anyway, they told me they'll text me when the internet comes back on. Well, when the internet comes back on, I'll know I don't need them to text me, but they're going to do that anyway. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, when I did get hung up on, one of the agents actually called me back, which was pretty fantastic, right? Oh, great. It said AT&T and everything, but I couldn't pick up on it because it said it was a spam caller and it hung up on them. So my AT&T phone actually hung up on AT&T services because their own number is listed as spam in their own network. Because I'm using their phone spam blocker. So anyway, good job guys, really good job. I think I just got this. Yeah, I didn't even need both hands after all. Oh, don't drop, oh, there it goes. Just drop the plate in the pan. Didn't want that to happen, but now it did. Anyway, we're pulling this out. We're looking for piston bits in the strainer. I didn't mean to bend it, but it's not the end of the world here. Actually, you know, it looks pretty good. All right, let's take it out in the sunlight. I'll shoot it down with a little bit of a uh, carburetor cleaner and see what it looks like on the inside. This might just be going back in. 
Anyways, no metallic piston bits or any other nonsense in there, so this sucker can be used again. It's a little scruffy looking, but it's an original Volkswagen part. Look, it's got the original stamping on there. See the little VW? You never see that on these things. So anyway, I'm going to put this one back in. It's going to clean it up a little bit, and it goes. No reason to uh, not use that. Okay, well good. And she'll get all new gasket seals and copper rings at the same time because it looks like a little copper washer. Some of them were missing. I'm surprised it didn't leak. All right. Let's throw it back in there. When we torque these down, I think they only get like uh, eight foot pounds or something. Yeah, those little eight millimeter studs. You don't over torque them because you don't want to strip the magnesium case. Big no no, guys. 15 minutes later. I got everything put back together on there. Didn't torque those bolts too tight, put the drain plug back in. The other side of this looks a little greasy, waxy, but it's it's not wet. It's just shiny, like like paint or something, but I don't think it is, because it looks like it's dirty at the same time. So I don't know if somebody painted over some dirt or what. I'm going to hit the underside of this with some degreaser by the time I'm done with all this and uh, just give it a good rinse. Anything I can do to make it a little better than what it is. And for whatever it's worth, it'll stop that kind of stuff from happening from the little bit of oil that's dripping around the edges that rag couldn't catch. And that'll hit my driveway too, so. <laughs> I hate having oil stains in my driveway. And you know, even though I have Volkswagens, I have no oil stains in my driveway. No, well, good. All right, well, while we're in here, we're gonna change the oil out in the bubbler also. So, pull this off. Pull the air cleaner off. Again, don't knock this thing sideways because it will leak. This is full of oil, guys. At least it should be. <laughs> Can't tell you what's going on with it before I got to it. Yeah, it's, it's almost empty. You see, there's almost no oil in there at all, and it's actually very, very clean. So that means this air cleaner wasn't doing its job. Well, I'm going to dump out what's in there, and then we're going to fill that back up to level. Yeah, that oil in there is so clean because it wasn't being used. I think you're supposed to put a cord in there. Well, we'll get that straightened up too. And yes, my oil pan's right here on the ground, guys. I'm not dumping it right directly on the driveway or pouring in my grass or, you know, dumping it in the street. No, it's an oil pan right here. Yeah, I actually have to say that. I can't believe I have to say that, but I have to say that kind of stuff. go. I got my cap off for the oil because I was going to do that also. So let's go ahead and put our oil in everything. Well, you guys missed it. I thought I hit the record button, but I didn't. And I poured three quarts in the engine. It actually only needs 2.9, but I put in three. It's always nice to have three flat. That way you don't have a little bit left in the bottom of your, your quart container. And I went and dumped all the oil. Well, you saw, I already dumped all the oil out of the air cleaner, and I've since refilled that also. So the oil bath cleaner is ready to go. My dirty hands got everything nice and greasy. I may just put a little degreaser in here too, just a quick shot, and it missed it down just to clean it up because otherwise it's gonna attract dirt. Yeah, I'm not happy. I spilled a lot more oil than I wanted to. Spilled it down the back of the car here. Yeah, it's just not like me at all, but I'm standing in the sun, and you guys know how I can't handle the sun very well, so I'm trying to work a little faster. That's my valid excuse. I don't belong where I'm standing. This is not my environment. <laughs> All right, well, there it is. We're good. Should be able to start it. We're going to move it, and we're going to replace that gas filter that's sitting right here in the fuel line in the engine compartment because that's a bad spot for it. We're back. I fired it on up after I degreased it. I completely degreased the engine because this thing was a mess. Look how clean it is now. You can actually see the block. You can actually see down in there too where there was no paint. It was just black, greasy, yuck, just covering it up. And I have no idea why it was so bad. But good now. Any of the oil that I spilled down the back of the body when I was trying to fill up the oil is so all cleaned out now. I cleaned up my driveway so the oil stain should be a minimum. So, all right. I feel pretty good about it. Fired right up even though the engine's wet. That's good. We're gonna move it finish up the uh, pedal cluster adjustment and figure out why we have a generator light on the dashboard it's still on I don't know what the deal is probably the regulator once again which is right down there so we'll get it figured out 
wanted to take you for a quick spin from the passenger seat once again. <laughs> Throws my judgment off, that's for sure. <laughs> it's got a little pull to the right, just a little tiny one. Engine sounds good though. No unusual knocks, ticks, bangs, no misfires of any sort. Suspension feels good. our fingers and make sure the brakes work good too. <laughs> oh yeah, they're good. They're nice and stiff too. Remember we saw those braided stainless lines underneath there? So weird driving from the passenger seat. But I have to. <laughs> and climbing it actually goes a little over 17 so it appears that the regulator which is down there needs to be replaced hey duck man did you know it's a voltage regulator underneath the back seat For some reason I got a lot of that on the last video anyway we're gonna replace that today I've got a spare one here and I hope the spare one works but we're about to find out <laughs> there it is that voltage is climbing I don't mind that uh, the screen on this thing. It's uh, something I inherited from Dad and I think he left it out in the sun somewhere. By the way, the heat got to it. 
No, but the screw in here is like extremely tight for some reason too. These things don't need to be that tight. This is the one screw that always gets lost too. This disconnected voltage goes to the harness. Disconnect the idiot light. Disconnect the DF terminal. And then over here we have ground, which is quite literally the same screw that the voltage regulator attaches to the body. screwdriver with me because it acted like a nut driver and got the last screw out that was the wrong screw. <laughs> if this wasn't a convertible this job wouldn't be as easy. I have a lot more room leaning in through this window that rolls down. I might add it's a rear window that rolls down. You can see that on a traditional sedan beetle. No. Here's the old regulator. It's a Bosch. A dead Bosch. Okay. This one doesn't have it yet. Let's make sure we put it in right here. This is such a finicky and tight area to work. As I said, screws get lost quite easily. our negative wire which is the same screw that mounts the entire regulator to the body. This is screw. I know I'm gonna drop it. I always drop these things. If I don't drop the screw at least once today. It's not me doing the job, I have a body double. <laughs> Let me drop these damn screws. This awkward little area in here is really hard to work. Okay, I'm gonna put voltage in. Somebody put the wrong screw in the middle of it. This thing is a little tight up here. 
here it is tight all right here's our DF wire from the generator here's our idiot light and the great thing about these is the wires are specific lengths so if you try to hook the wrong one to the wrong terminal it's pretty obvious why it won't fit or won't reach I should say you know I used to know somebody in the auto body shop that I worked in as a teenager. And when wires and things wouldn't fit, to him in his mind, it wasn't because um, it doesn't belong there. It was because it doesn't reach. So he'll start cutting wires and splicing things in and hooking up tail lights the wrong way. And when a car is about to leave the shop, we would check all the tail lights on to make sure everything was working step on the brakes and the turn signal on one side comes on and the backup light on the other side comes on. The guy was just an idiot. It's like, dude, the wires, they only go just so far. You put it right in the hole it fits in. <laughs> anyway, this is from our battery. This is the one that goes back to the harness. So we are now plugged in and should be good. Just making sure that we get to short shortest out. A gap around everything. Volkswagens, they like to expose stuff. If you threw your house keys or something on this, pshht, yeah, it'd be bad. <laughs> Alright, let's try to start it. See if it fixed the idiot light warning. The battery reconnected. Let's see what happens here. Idiot lights are on like they're supposed to be. Oops, I shut it off. <laughs> We still have a generator light. Okay, now that could be because that regulator is no good too. Could also be that something else is wrong, but. <laughs> well, let's check the voltage again and see what it says. All right, same problem. Showing about 16 and a half volts, so yeah, that regulator is no good either. Let's see if I have one more, otherwise we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have to go buy a new one. Good thing is, most of the um, auto shops around here uh, actually do stock them. Let's see if I can pick one up later today or even in the morning. So I'm just about done with this today. I had enough of this this heat, this oppressive heat. If it wasn't for the breeze that we had out here, I wouldn't be out here this long at all. Thankfully, we don't have as much sun today. Otherwise, yeah, you wouldn't see me out here until after five. But I got really nice shade in front of the house. Well, anyway, we can't go turning on lights and stuff because 16 volts showing almost 18 now we'll surely cook the uh, light bulbs in uh, fast order so okay now let's shut it back off they're actually kind of nice you can actually look on the inside of them I don't know if they're meant to be serviceable but you can see how they work and they have a set of points in them right here you see the points on either side where this little lever bounces back and forth opening and closing those points and this is what physically limits the, the voltage there was no such thing as uh, well it may have been but there wasn't at the time they weren't being used as a uh, solid state um, voltage regulator circuits componentry so what they did was they relied on good old me good old-fashioned mechanical stuff that physically limits the current by disconnecting it and that's how it works really simple stuff old mechanical Anyway, sometimes you can clean those points and they'll work. So we'll give it a shot. We'll try it, put it back together, and if we get lucky, great. If not, then we're going to just go purchase another one. But I, I think that's what's wrong. Bad regulator and the replacement I put in was no good either. All right, well, we needed a voltage regulator quick and easy, so I picked up one from the local auto parts place. And look at this. 12-volt regulator. The big benefit to this, I had a lifetime guarantee on it, and that's Declan Don texting the crap out of me like a dildo. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we got a new one. Lifetime guarantee. I mean, that's kind of hard to beat. I mean, even if it blows up once a year, it's free replacement, lifetime guarantee. So anyway, we'll save the receipt to that one. I really would have rather gotten a solid state, but that wasn't available locally, and it wasn't available today. And We need to fix this thing right now. So let me get on that, put this thing together, and let's see if that voltage regulator, and let's see if that generator light goes out like it's supposed to. All right, our new regulator is in there. Here we go. Go ahead and try to get this thing started. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, 
generator light's still on. The RPMs are kind of low. There it goes. Yeah, it's still cold, but yeah, generator light is out. Okay. Well, that's an improvement. It wasn't doing anything before, so it definitely was the regulator. I might need to raise the idle just a little bit. Wait till it's warm and see if it's okay. I mean, of course, I set the idle on it yesterday. We had some terrible rains yesterday, too, by the way. And they're expected to come back tonight in about the next hour or two from that direction. Same direction they came last night. They caused all kinds of tornadoes and threw sticks. These sticks were everywhere. I got a mountain of them that I collected. The yeah, RPMs are coming up on it already. Okay, good. I think we're we're properly set now. But anyway, you notice there's uh, water droplets in here, so something was leaking or weeping or something, but I can't find anything wet up and above. Nonetheless, there's uh, probably a, a bad seal somewhere that's causing a bit of a leakage. So I pulled the carpets out and I got them hung up because they were damp. I just want to stop it from molding. This is Florida after all. And then uh, tonight, we'll get this thing covered up before it rains again. Beautiful car otherwise. There's probably a bad seal or maybe it came in from around the window. It seems to be where it is because it was wet up top kind of high. Of course, now the camera won't focus. Oh. It was wet up kind of high and a little shelf here above the battery. So it was coming from definitely up top, not from side windows or anything. And it's mostly on the passenger side, but the passenger side is also sitting a little bit lower. <clears throat> so anyway, I got the front propped up. Oh look, it's pushing the ramp over. <laughs> got the front propped up and it made a little tiny weep hole back there to let the water out. That's something that I do to all my Volkswagens. They all have a little weep hole, so if they get any water in them, it's allowed to get back out before it causes other issues. All right, well, getting her lights still out. Let's double check. This car is beautiful. I like this little one. Yeah. <clears throat> yep, still out. Good. Okay, we're going to call that fixed. I need to address the pedal cluster down there, which is a usually a 13 millimeter bolt that goes straight down the back of the pedals and into the floor and it's on the other side of the pedals forward of them so i'll get in there and i'll loosen it there's a little l-shaped bracket kind of shape like that with the bolt going through it and it's probably turned probably the other way turned that way which is allowing the pedal to go all goofy but anyway i'll get that fixed i'm not even going to video that because there's no way for me to hold a camera under there and it's kind of dark in there too so but we'll get that situated then I gotta move that fuel filter and she's done. This car is just, it needed so little, so little. Yeah, she's a runner. Okay, as I went in here to adjust the pedal cluster, you notice you can see some daylight. You're not supposed to see daylight down there. There's a, a hole about the size of a silver dollar underneath the pedal cluster. And when I was looking for that 13 millimeter bolt so I could adjust it so I could raise this brake pedal up to where it belongs, um, I discovered all of this. So this was covering that rust hole. So it looks like this is its little skeleton in the closet here. Okay, so this is gonna have to be fixed. That's gonna have to be repaired. But it's outside of the scope of this video for today. Because what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to remove the pedal cluster. I'm going to have to peel all the carpet back. I'm going to have to cut a little section out of the floor in here. Approximate where the hole is supposed to be drilled for the pedal adjuster. Drill it, weld a nut on the underside of it, drop the piece in, reinstall the pedal cluster, and then bolt everything down the way it belongs. Well, again, that's outside of what I'm doing today because uh, <laughs> this wasn't what I expected at all. Whoever uh, had this service last did a pretty good job of covering stuff up with this rubber paste so you couldn't see all the uh, rust damage that was up front here now what i understand is the floor pans in this have been replaced at some point in the past so i think instead of repairing this portion of it correctly somebody shortcutted it anyway yeah we're in a in a bad spot on this one but this needs to be fixed the pedal needs to be right about here uh, there are other ways that I suppose I can do this. I think I could maybe put a stop up underneath the underside of it over here, something that your feet won't get in the way of. All it is is just a stop. It just stops the pedal from falling down. It's not something that actually holds any stresses. It's not something that um, 
uh, it's not a moving part, you know what I mean? It doesn't actually affect how the brakes operate, it just makes the pedal convenient to reach. Versus down here where you have to get your foot under it, for a size 15 like I have, that's extremely inconvenient because I have to get under it, lift it, then get on it to push it. So if you're a small footed person, you might be able to get away with it otherwise by just pushing it in. But yeah, for me, that's not going to work. So we're going to have to straighten that out and get that fixed too. But again, not scope of this video. I'm a little upset about that, but that's the best that I can do with that one for today. All right, there it goes. All right, the clouds are rolling in right on time. It looks like ice crystals and stuff, but on the other side of that is where the rain's coming from. In fact, you can see it's even darker over that way. Okay, well, I got that fun to deal with. I'm going to leave the pedal cluster alone for the time being. We'll handle that later. But I do need to fix where the fuel filter lives. So what I think I'll do is I'll pull the fuel filter out, as well as the little stub that's connected to it. Run the fuel line directly into the pump. And taking the stub and the fuel line, reversing the uh, line to the opposite side, plug it in underneath the car instead. Done. Shouldn't take too long. The hardest part is, of course, getting under the car. So I'm going to have to jack it up and pull that wheel off so I can get in there. But uh, otherwise, yeah, not too bad. All right, well, let's, let's get right, on it. No more fuel filter in the engine compartment. We relocated it right there. In fact, I'm going to move it just a little bit to get it out of the way of the axle boot. But uh, it's under the car now, so if it decides to leak, it leaks on the ground instead of on the hot engine. So, dramatically reduces the risk of fire. And I did put that in right, didn't I? Yeah, it's in right, okay. <laughs> Second thoughting myself here. All right, good. All right, there you go. You can't even see it now because it's tucked up underneath there and it's away from that axle. You didn't want to get it caught on there. All right, good to go. Put that wheel back on. All right, this is the part of the video that everybody always requests of me. Duckman, you need a smaller car. You know, I always tell him to get a thing or get a something else or get a something. And I always tell him I can't fit in these things and it doesn't help that these seats are apparently welded in position. But you need to get in here And the seat's welded in about halfway back. So it actually could go back further. But not too much. All right, I'm in here. And yeah, technically I guess I could drive it from this position. This is the first time I actually tried to squeeze in here like this. <laughs> Whew, there's not much room in here at all. going to be it for now so licky likey comment and subscribe don't forget to pluck that dingle belly so you get updates every time that i upload a new video check out duckshit.net for all of my different social media links and we'll see you guys next time on the next go around and i guess technically it's probably small engine saturday and i didn't even get a small engine video up bummer dudes well we'll try again next week right i guess you guys get this instead <laughs> thanks for watching and it goes Did you guys think it was mine? <laughs> I never would have fit in there. <laughs> Sounds good driving off though. All right, thanks for watching everyone. We got coming up this week. I'm waiting on some parts so I can finish putting the spindles down underneath here. This is something that uh, can't be finished because there's a little camber adjuster that's supposed to go on the top ball joint and I couldn't get the old ones off for the old ball joints. They were just jammed on there with rust and uh, I tried to press them, I tried to beat on them, there was just no chance of them coming off, so I stopped. Rather than destroy my tools, I just quit, and I had the uh, owner of this order up, order up a new set. I'm also missing a rubber gogi over on the other side. Um, the rubber gogi goes on the arm on the bottom there. It's uh, kind of crumbly and it fell apart. Three of them were good, one of them was bad, which makes no sense because the other three look like they're brand new, so I don't know if somebody got under here and did some work before at some point, but nonetheless, it needs one more rubber gogi, but the problem is we can't seem to find the order, just one. So he's ordered up a set of four of them, and I guess I might as well just replace them all. So I haven't actually bolted any of that down yet. Everything's just kind of slipped together for the moment. The Z got a flat. <laughs> 
that's what we worked on last week. You guys got to see a little bit of that. And uh, after the car, everything was working. It was all good. And I thought it had a slow leak. It turned into a fast leak, and it just completely lets the air out of it in a couple hours. Otherwise, it drives fine, except for that little hop on the tire. So I got to pull together a little bit of budget for that. I got to buy a new set of wheels. I've been looking on Marketplace, or tires, I should say. I have been looking on Marketplace, though, for a new set of rims or wheels and tires set. So that way I can put something on there a little different. You know, for the price of a set of tires on the front here installed, which is probably four and something dollars, I could buy a set of used rims with okay tires on it for the whole car and just upgrade the whole thing. But the other problem I've got is it also has a wheel lock on it and I lost the damn key to it. Now, I made a key to get that lock out of there, which does work, but there's a lot of rust on that key and it doesn't want to move. And it's been on there now for about the last four years. So that's going to be a little bit of a fight. So I can't take that tire anywhere or have anything replaced on it until I get that removed. Because if I have somebody else service that, it's going to be expensive. I might even have to drill it, and I'm not looking forward to that. But here we got the square back, and I've begun working on this thing. You might remember that it was going to have a door replaced. There's the door that came off of it, which has severe rust on the bottom of it. And the whole bottom of that door is shot. So the owner of the car gave me another door, and we put that on there. Now, I was watching some videos from... Uh, Mike F. and Garage and uh, Slade's Beetles, and they so easily remove these door screws. They simply put the impact in there and a couple taps and the things just come out for them. And they don't have any problems. Mike mentioned that sometimes he has to heat them up a little bit to get them out, 10 minutes with the torch. I put it on there, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. I spent all damn day on these screws, but I finally did get them out. And what's funny is none of them wanted to come out. The top two I heated, and I mean I heated them just profusely. In fact, the old door is uh, all burnt up here because the paint started to catch fire. Was, I heated it up that much. And um, the top two screws finally came out. They finally started to budge and they moved. And then when it went down to the bottom ones, before I even heated it, it's like they were intimidated by what I had just done to the top ones and the fuckers turned. Both of them just, they came out. I just, I don't even know why. They wouldn't come out, wouldn't come out, wouldn't come out. After I fucked with the top two, the bottom two just came loose. So anyway, this door works wonderfully on here. I mean, the fitment of this thing is just, it's fantastic. I haven't even done any real adjustment to it. I got it on and it seemed to have uh, gone on properly on the first try. I mean, the door seams are lining up. Everything is nice and flush. The body lines are all lined up. All I did was follow the markings that were on the old doors to where the hinges were bolted in, and that seems to be good. So, Otherwise, next on the list on this thing is getting it uh, running, if it's at all possible. I got the owners bringing me a battery for it, so I can put one in there. I don't want to take my stuff apart to uh, start running his stuff, if you know what I mean. Last thing I need is to have one of my batteries blow up because this car did something to it. I don't like using my my car parts or testing things on my cars, if you might understand. And that was something that came from working on my old computers in my computer shop. Because if I had to test a customer's power supply or a video card or something, I used to just stick it in my own computer until one day that one of their pieces of equipment fried my fucking computer, which of course makes me liable and the customer's not going to pay for fixing my machine. So I don't do that anymore, not with cars either, no. If it doesn't work, then it just doesn't work. I'm not trying it in my car. <laughs> I'm not taking my car apart to fix your car. No, no, no. Now I might take something off my car to fix your car, but I'm not putting your shit on my car. It's just, don't do that, guys. If you've ever been involved in that, don't do that. In addition, I got the wheel off in the back here because when I changed out the fuel pump, and you can see it dangling down there. I haven't finished screwing it all in yet. But there was a little puddle underneath the transmission, and while Bill said, hey, that thing's got a main seal leak, that's got to be what it is, and that's the approximate location where it was leaving a wet spot. Well, when I got underneath the car, I smelled some gas, and sure enough, I found that that little tiny puddle, which wasn't bigger than this, was actually fuel that was weeping out of the fuel line. Just a weep. I mean, it wasn't like a steady drip. It was just a little tiny weep that just caused a couple little drops once in a while and made a little puddle. Anyway, I didn't think too much of it until I started moving those fuel lines around when I removed the fuel pump, and sure enough, the line ruptured. And these things, I think they hold like 16 gallons of gas. And you can see that bucket underneath there. I filled that bucket two and a quarter times, roughly, something like that. And I don't know how much of it got on the ground in the time that I ran into the backyard to go grab the bucket and the oil pan and whatever I could. But I filled up two six-gallon cans, and I still had a little bit left over. And then whatever went on the ground after that. So I, it was probably close to full. And I couldn't tell that it was even that way because the fuel gauge up on the dashboard wasn't reporting anything over E. So I don't know what its problem is, but yeah, it doesn't work right either, but that's not what I was contracted to work on. So anyway, I gotta go pick up some fuel line for that and put that back together. And then we gotta do a carburetor upgrade on here and get that finalized as well. But after that's done, then I think we're good to go. 
You can probably hear Biddy in the backyard screaming at me because he hears my voice talking in the front. Their ears are very, very good. So let's go have a look at the chickens. Probably tell everything's all wet because it's been raining and raining and raining. It started about four o'clock in the morning. It stopped early in the morning. We had a little bit of sun briefly and then it started raining again around 10. And it's been on again, off again all day long. And I mean, it's been thundering, booming, and just generally been bad, bad. It's actually stopped just enough now. See, Biddy? You see me? You jerk. You jerk. Here he is. Let's see if he attacks the camera. Probably will. <laughs> Guaranteed your money back. Cheeky's been a good girl. She was pestering me. She wanted to go inside to lay an egg, so I let her inside, and then she didn't lay an egg. I gave her a whole bunch of little treats and foods, and then she went back outside, so I think she just wanted her treats. <laughs> Came inside just to get treats. Otherwise, uh, oh. Looks like there was an egg in there. Yeah, I see it. Is that an egg? No, it's not an egg. I thought this was a piece of an eggshell here. What is that? Okay, you can come out. <laughs> come on, Fluffy. Fluffy's a sweet little bird. There she is. Fluffy's a sweet little bird. Mm hmm. Daddy's girl. You are daddy's girl. <laughs> Got something in my mouth, something out of your feathers. <laughs> Wanna go run around and play? Go ahead. <laughs> She's becoming more and more tame. I should have uh I should have sat with her and played with her a whole lot more when she was younger, but I didn't do that. She would hang out with her brother primarily and they grew up together, so she has a little bit of an aversion to being handled, but I've been handling her a lot more in the last couple weeks, sitting with her at night, giving her treats kind of thing. And she refuses treats, which is a really weird thing. Of all the animals, these two are the only ones that refuse, refuse treats. The Peanut and Fluffy both don't want treats. They're both a couple of dummies. Yes, they are. <laughs> Cheeky will take anything I give her, especially ice cream. Biddy likes ice cream too, but you remember I raised Biddy by hand. So Biddy understands um, human life. Even though he's a jerk, when it comes down to it, he still understands who his daddy is and he still will sit with me and eat ice cream and other treats and you know, he can actually be a good little bird if he wants to, but he has to be getting something for it. He's not going to uh, give me anything without getting something in return. That's just the way he is. <laughs> Frosty's minding her business. Fred Frosty, it looks like you want out. You probably need to lay an egg too. You laid an egg yesterday. It looked like a football. It was really long with points on each end. <laughs> and Mama's over there somewhere. Where the hell is she? Way over there. It's like she's digging a hole or something. Oh, what's the matter, Cheeky? You want out too? You see Frosty's out, so now you want out? <laughs> come on. It's almost time to come in anyway. It's starting to get a little dark out here. Yeah. Doesn't help that it's so overcast, but uh, it's going to get dark, dark. I discovered that uh, my pepper plants are growing like crazy, which you guys know, but now they're starting to change color. And I've actually been plucking them off and started eating them. And these suckers are really good this year. These have an incredible flavor on them. I mean, they haven't been bad in the past, but... If I had to compare the old ones to the ones that are growing today, same plant. The old ones were bland. These have an extreme flavor to them, but I've been fertiluting them. I've been watering them every other day. It also helps that it's been raining so damn much. And they're in direct sunlight now because we don't have trees here anymore since the hurricane took all the trees down. So these things are in uh, direct sunlight all day long. This plant is throwing peppers everywhere. So this one's going to be a hell of a harvest too. Like I said, the green ones have more of a bitter flavor, like a green pepper, but they're really spicy, and of course, when they start changing color, they get sweeter. They give you the habanero flavor that you're, that you're used to. This plant in here has a couple growing on it also, but this one has grown all the new shoots, so this one will probably be growing more peppers later. I'm starting to see a couple blossoms on it a few places. Yeah, you can see them down in there. So, that one's going to be blooming a little bit later than the others. And I don't even know if it's the same kind of pepper plant. This could be a poblano. Looking at the leaves, it's a good possibility because the leaves are different. But there are poblanos and habaneros that are in the pot. I planted them together. And you might ask, why did you do that, Doug? Man, it's because I read online that poblanos and habaneros like to grow together and like to rub on each other because they're perverts or something. I don't know. But anyway, it makes them more successful. I don't think it made a difference at all. And in fact, the poblano in here is dead. And the poblano that was in there, well, you know, it still might be here. No, it looks like there was a poblano in here and now it's two habaneros, so <laughs> it must have had a baby. 
or it grew a second shoot. Yeah, so the poblano on that one's apparently gone. But there are two stems in there also, three stems even. So, you might still have active poblanos growing in there. Well, I guess that's about it from the Critter Ranch. All that's going on here, we gotta get to go working on some go-kart stuff. I did get the other missing trailing arm. Remember we had that trailing arm situation where I got shipped two left-hand side ones and I needed a righty? Well, the company in question sent me the uh, right side one recently without me even having to follow up and ask for it, which to me is amazing. Because anytime that somebody messes something up on me, I have to go through a whole bunch of steps and processes to chase people, to make things, and they took care of things on their own. They're just completely awesome. They emailed me and told me that it was coming. They sent me a tracking number. You know, here it is. And it was approximately the date that I was supposed to ask them to check, but they did it on their own. I, I didn't have to. So we're going to be talking about them in the future. I'm not promising anything, but there is a possibility that you may even see a sponsorship because uh, I'm not impressed with the way the company handled things. I mean, there was a mistake made, but it was their vendor that did. It wasn't them. So I'm happy. But that means this whole trailing arm's coming off. And all the parts that are not trailing arm are going on the KT. And this thing's about to get a proper IRS rear suspension with Volkswagen driveline components. And you might remember me doing the bearings and the axles and all that stuff. So you'll see that coming up in the very, very near future. Maybe even as soon as this week. And if I get the Z fixed by then, that means the KT196 will be out for the speed contest. Link down below in the video description, guys. Get over there. Leave a speed contest guess if you'd like to know. Or if you'd like to guess how fast this thing's going to go. I don't know yet, but I, I know it's it's a peppy little machine. But we're going to give it a couple passes. I think we'll do it like we did on a Doodle Bash. So three passes. And whatever the top speed is of uh, whichever one of those passes was the fastest <laughs> is the speed we're going to go with. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Anyway, those wheels are coming off. I'm going to put these smaller spindles back on with the smaller wheels because that could possibly slow me down a little bit. I mean, I did all this stuff for off-road. We're going to do an on-road test with this thing and see just how fast it goes. Anyway, I guess that's about it. We're going to wrap this one up for today. Oh, I touched that pepper plant, you know what? And I just touched my forehead. My forehead's burning. Yeah, I smell it. I can smell it on my fingers. A little bit of pepper. Okay, yeah, so I did get a little bit of uh, juice. And all I did was touch the leaves, but just a little bit, man. My forehead's on fire. I just touched above my left eyebrow, and I can feel it. Wow, that hurts. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go wash my face. Thanks, guys, for watching. Licky, likey, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to pluck that dinglebilly so you get updates every time I upload a new video. Check out DuckShit down there for all of my different social media links. And we'll see you guys in the next go-round. Thanks for watching, everybody. Boom.